This week on the Backtable Podcast. It talks about a concept of what's referred to as the red threads of your life, which are the things in your life that really flip your switch and make you coming back for more. And that could be at work, it could be recreationally, it could be in any aspect of your life. And that most people, if they're lucky, can incorporate some aspect of that into their career to the age old adage of, you know, if you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. But nobody really loves everything that they do, right? So for some people, mentorship is one of their red threads. And those are the types of people as a mentee that you want to seek out. Hello, everyone. And welcome back to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Hello, everybody. This is Jay Shaw. I am guest hosting the Backtable Urology podcast today. And I have with me as our guest, Dr. James McKiernan, who I'll let introduce himself in a minute. But I will preface by saying that James was my mentor when I was a fourth-year medical student at Columbia, and he continued to be my mentor through residency, through fellowship, and beyond. And to this day, he's one of the folks that I reach out to when I need some mentoring help. When I approached Aditya about doing this podcast, and we agreed that it would be great to have an episode on the mentor-mentee relationship, making it work for everyone, Jim's name came instantly to my mind, and I'm so thrilled, Jim, that you are here. Thank you for, A, for being my mentor the last, hard to say it, 21 years. I cannot tell you the impact that you've had on my life. And I'm so excited to have you share your wisdom and your thoughts on this topic with the world. So thank you for joining us. And I'd love for you to take a a couple of minutes to introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jay. And I really appreciate the opportunity to join you in this format. It's kind of interesting after 20 plus years of knowing you to be here recording and discussing some of the things that we talk about all the time. And it's been my privilege to be able to do that with you over the years. So my name is Jim McKiernan. As you pointed out, I'm currently the department chair of urology at Columbia University and New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. And until very recently, also took on a role as a senior vice dean of clinical affairs in our medical school here in New York City. And I focus my practice in urologic oncology and have had the honor and privilege to be associated with medical students, residents, fellows, junior faculty, both in our field and even sometimes in other fields throughout my career. And really have seen mentorship as an unusual way to pretend like you're helping somebody and actually get self-help in return in the sense that most mentor-mentee relationships start out with the mentee seeking out guidance from a more senior, more experienced person without necessarily recognizing that that senior, more experienced person is on the receiving end of a process that tends to benefit them maybe even more than the mentee. And that's what's kind of fascinated me in the second half of my career is is that the benefits of being a mentor as opposed to the service you give to the mentee. And uh, I think that's what inhibits some people from getting involved in these kind of things. I think it's all one way, but it's actually probably 60-40 the other way in most cases. I love that you just started with that because that's exactly where my mind goes. And that's why we titled this episode, Making It Work for Everyone. Because exactly as you said, I think mentoring isn't just what we all think it is when we start out, that it's going to be helping someone younger find their way. There is so much for the mentor themselves in the whole process as well. And I'd love to explore that with you a bit as we get further into the episode. But let's start at the very basics. In terms of mentoring, You're obviously very good at it, both from my direct personal experience, as well as looking at the last 20 years of trainees, both medical students, residents, fellows, junior faculty that have come out of your program and what you've done there. What was your approach to mentoring when you first started? How did you know that you wanted to be a mentor? Was it something you knew or something you were told to do? Yeah, I'm not not sure I knew it for sure, but honestly, in early on and very similar to when I met you at first, it was oftentimes trying to, I would say, build a team and get things done. And in exchange for that, the the currency was wisdom and mentorship. So take a classic example in our field, a rising medical student who says, I think I want to start a career in urology. What's the first thing that you and I probably worked on? Let's do a project together. 
right? So let's write a paper. Let's do a research study. Let's do something where we're going to recruit you into the field. And the payoff is that you're going to learn a lot about the field. You're going to get to spend time with a resident or fellow or junior faculty member. And you're going to figure out, is this the right career for me? And is this something that I want to spend the rest of my life doing? And along the way, I'm going to have questions. How do I apply? How do I get in? How do I match? How do I do this? But in the meantime, you're actually working towards a common goal. And so as I got drawn into it, it was sort of how do you use that currency, mentorship, to be able to recruit people in and build an early research team, build an early clinical program. And the payoff was, hey, I'm willing to spend a lot of time and, and effort. And over the years, I've seen that work well, and I've seen other circumstances where it hasn't worked well because people don't realize from the mentor level that that requires a time commitment and effort on behalf of the mentor to kind of pay it back, right? You can't just simply say, hey, come work with me for a year, spend, take a year off for med school and come work with me. And by the way, I'm going to talk to you once every six months during that year, and hopefully you're going to write a bunch of papers and then you'll get matched somewhere in residency. No, you have to pour yourself into that. And that's the payoff to the person that you're working with is that they get a lot of your time, a lot of your brain, a lot of your wisdom, a lot of your experience. And sometimes it's even get in the right environment and get that from student to resident, resident to fellow, resident to resident. It doesn't always have to be faculty member to early career trainee, putting somebody into that environment, like putting them into a laboratory, all kinds of resources in terms of career advice and mentorship can be put at your disposal. And meanwhile, you're kind of working towards a goal and you're helping the team move forward. And you may not be getting paid a lot in money or credit or fame, but you're gaining a lot of experience and wisdom uh, through the process. Yeah, that's deep. I think what I heard you say is that mentorship, looking at it from the eyes of the mentor or the potential mentor, isn't just an avenue for free labor. It's work. And you have to approach it that way. You have to see that I have to put in work. There is output from that. There are rewards if you do it right and build a program, et cetera, where the other things can happen. But for the potential mentors, you have to go into it thinking, I have to do stuff for this to actually work. I think that's really important because mentorship is like, it's like, what is the phrase? Apple pie and motherhood. And no one's got a problem with mentorship. And, you know, you can't say mentorship is bad. And everyone wants to say, I'm a good mentor. And of course, I want to focus on mentorship. But I think for a lot of people, they struggle with how do I actually do it in a way that's meaningful for everybody involved. We'd all agree, finding a great mentor-mentee relationship is ideal. And I think we can all probably think of relationships in the mentoring realm where you do all the work on both sides and don't feel like it's actually working for anybody. What are the things that you do when you're entering into a mentoring relationship in terms of setting parameters or setting expectations, et cetera, to set both yourself and the mentee up for success? That's a great question. I think first and foremost is learning when to say no. I think one of the biggest problems is committing to something that you can't deliver on. So you might find that there's multiple people that want to be mentored at the same time. And it's easy to say yes to everybody and then deliver poorly to all of them. And much like many things in life, knowing when to say no is more important than knowing when to say yes sometimes. So you you have to say, you know what, I'm committed already. I got a lot going on right now. If I did this for you, I really wouldn't be able to give you the full attention you need. So I'm going to pass on this opportunity. I think that's very critical to success early on. And then trying to establish some of the parameters as to what the mentee and the mentor expect to get out of the, the interaction, the relationship, being realistic about it up front. What kind of time commitment is everybody comfortable with and agreeable with? And being able to set those expectations early on and some of the goals and sort of stick to it because it's kind of easy to say, yeah, I was your mentor. That's great. What did we, what did we actually accomplish? Nothing. Uh, what did you teach me? Nothing. How much time did we spend together during the last year? Um, very little. But, you know, you could put down on your CV that I was your mentor and then maybe that'll help you get a job one day. That's not what it's about. It's actually about the substance of what goes on in the relationship. And I think the key there is it's got to be organic. You may remember this, you may not, but when, when we had residents at one point, we would assign them mentors and you were actually assigned to me involuntarily by some process. You didn't pick me? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I would have if I had the opportunity. And we actually abandoned that model after about five or 10 years because 
you know, every program sort of had to check the box to say, do you offer mentorship to your young up and coming trainees? Yes, we do. Every one of them is assigned a mandatory faculty mentor. They have to meet with them X number of times per year and they have to sit down and kind of have a forced mentor mentee relationship. And that rarely works. It may lead to some, you know, capacity to say that you did something and nobody fell through the cracks. Nobody went without the opportunity to meet a mentor or have a faculty sponsor, but it has to be more organic in the sense that there has to be some shared priorities, shared values between the two people. And hopefully the mentee looks towards the mentor as a role model in some way to say, hey, I want this person's advice and good counsel because it looks like they turned out okay. And I wouldn't mind if, you know, I followed their path going forward, whether it's in business, medicine, law, wherever it may be. So it's hard to force feed that. And you have to have that sort of happen spontaneously, organically, in my opinion. Got it. So the parameters that, that I heard you describe right now were, number one, learn to say no. You can't mentor everybody. And you have to have a manageable number of mentees, especially when you're starting and still learning the process. Be very clear on what the expectations, timelines, et cetera, are, how often you expect to meet, what you and they are hoping to get out of it, and try to keep it organic. You can't assign a mentor to someone and say, hey, the two of you, you're going to be the mentor, you're going to be the mentee, and assume that's automatically going to work. Is that correct? That's 100% correct. All right. On that first part, learning to say no, clearly from a time standpoint, there are constraints that you have to be mindful of. If you don't have enough time, you can't say yes, you can't accept a mentee. Are there other things that you hear when someone approaches you? Are there things that you look for? Do you ever say to yourself, ah, this kid's going to be a disaster. <laughs> I don't want to mentor them. Or is it the opposite? This kid's a disaster. I better mentor them so that I can guide them in the right way. Are there things that from the mentee side now that mentees can do or make sure they highlight that makes a potential mentor more likely to say, you know, I'm super busy because let's face it, who isn't? And I still want to create time and space in my life to mentor you. Yeah. So this is maybe in my own personal experience, but everybody wants an ROI on everything they do, a return on investment, right? So the mentor is no different. And the ideal mentee is somebody who has a lot of raw potential. It potentially could go wrong if not properly counseled, but you don't want to see that happen. You want to see them realize their raw potential so that the time invested, the wisdom shared, the life lessons learned all end up paying off. And when you're selective in, in that manner, you have to figure out like, hey, if I'm going to spend hours upon hours with this person, what's the ROI? Not necessarily for the mentor personally, like I get to take credit for shaping their career, but rather to whatever field you're in. What's the ROI for urology? And you don't want to waste a hundred hours on someone who is unsalvageably just lost. And, and you say, well, at the end of that, I didn't help anybody. I didn't help the mentee. I didn't help the team. I didn't help the field. I didn't help academic medicine. So being good at picking out that raw product, somebody who's got a lot of the right tools, but if they don't get some of the right guidance, they could end up not realizing their full potential, not utilizing all those tools, but with just a little bit of nudging in the right direction and some back and forth, maybe over 20 years, 10 years, five years, you could actually see them realize their full potential. Because I think we all know examples of people that seem like they had all the right tools, but a couple of bad decisions along the way, and they ended up either unsuccessful in their career, or unhappy in life, or leaving medicine or leaving their chosen field. And you say, wow, what a waste. That person had all the talent in the world. Would have been great if we could have kept them in cardiology or urology or whatever, whatever your field may be. And thinking about this from the mentee perspective, are there things that mentees can do to seem more attractive to a potential mentor in terms of that raw potential that you speak about? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, you certainly don't want to fake it, right? So you don't want to come up with some attributes that make you look like a good mentee when in fact you're unsalvageable, right? So you just be yourself, I guess, is the best advice you can give someone. But, you know, showing an earnest interest, being willing to put in the time, it sounds old fashioned, but studying hard, working hard, doing all the roles that you're asked to do at the level you're at. And again, that could be a junior professor, right? So I can sort of figure out where people are relatively quickly, no matter what rank. They could be the dean, they could be the president of the hospital, they could be, you, you know when somebody is sort of, hey, that's the type of person that I'd like to spend a lot of time 
either learning from as a mentee myself or helping teach and helping direct because I know that's time well spent both as a mentee yourself or as a mentor to the mentee. You can figure it out, but it's hard, it's hard to tell people other than be yourself, be sincere, work hard, do everything you're asked, and then you'll gain the attention of people to say, wow, that person got a lot of potential. Let me see if I can get involved with helping them, helping their career. Great. I'm glad you uh, elaborated on that. I thought you were going to stop at don't be unsalvageable, and it was going to be hard <laughs> for people to actualize. Yeah. I, I want to dive in a little bit into the, the relationship itself now, the mentor-mentee relationship. One of the things that I have noticed, both in my own mentor-mentee relationship from both sides of the equation, and that I've witnessed in other relationships, is that very often when something starts out, it's full of potential. Sounds like this is going to be great. Everyone's all in. Sounds great. And then what will happen is either on one side or the other, someone is falling short because of all the other constraints that people have in terms of time, other life priorities, et cetera. And instead of having that conversation of, hey, this isn't working for me in the way that we had agreed because of this, that, that, what will happen usually is one or the other will pull away. And then the mentor-mentee relationship enters into this slow downward spiral where they're, well, it's not worth it to ask that person because they're going to take forever to get back to me in either direction. Or I'm going to stop offering opportunities to that mentee because they take a really long time to get stuff done, etc. Walk me through how you approach keeping the relationship healthy. Specifically, if you're mentoring someone and they're not holding up their end of the bargain, so to speak, what does that conversation look like for you? When do you have it? How do you move forward from there? Yeah, and that's a, that's a more difficult situation. Naturally, what ends up happening is the relationship falls apart because one side is not holding up, as you said, their end of the bargain, and then that perpetuates itself, and you sort of fizzle out. And whether it's sort of a declared, I'm your mentor and I'm your mentee, and now it's not working and you declare that it's over, more commonly, that doesn't happen at the beginning. People don't sort of sit down and say, hey, would you like to enter into a contractual relationship as my mentor? Yes, I'll sign up for two hours a week and we'll do it every Sunday morning from nine to 11. And, and oh, wow, we haven't met for four weeks. I guess we've broken our contract here. We're no longer in our relationship. It's usually obviously much more organic and formal and not like that. But when it starts to fall apart, it, it's usually a time commitment issue, probably by the mentor more often than the mentee, because they don't see the value in the proposition anymore, and they deprioritize it in a schedule of other busy commitments. And you know, I had an opportunity recently through an interdepartmental program to be assigned somewhat randomly to have a surgeon in another specialty was just hired to have me as a mentor. And I tried to ensure that I wouldn't do that. And I said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a schedule where I take you to lunch every month and we're, it's going to be involuntary. It's going to be standing and I can't stand you up. So we're going to get a minimum of an hour, hour and a half of FaceTime in the building every month to sit down and go over. He was doing a project, an academic, clinical. How do I navigate this new place which just came in? And that structure kind of prevented that from falling apart because that was one where I didn't really know them. I was picked into this program involuntarily. I didn't sign up for it and had a lot of potential to disintegrate into not a great relationship. And just by saying, you know, let's just map this out here and put some stop gaps. We missed a few lunch dates. We didn't certainly make every single one, but we built in some structures so that there was phone calls and emails in between and happenstance interactions in the hallway, but we had a fixed time and I actually found myself looking forward to it because as I said earlier, I was learning a lot more from him about life than he was for me. But getting together and, and having that on the schedule, just like a patient or just like an operating room session or a Zoom call, it has to happen. And particularly in a virtual world, you can do it. But it's just, this was live pre-pandemic. It just became kind of a priority. It rose up my priority scale and cheated out other things as opposed to saying, oh, what am I going to do with this scheduled mentorship appointment? Let me push it down here right after filling out my epic chart notes, you know, in my priority scale. It became like something that, that you really wanted to do and you looked forward to it when you looked in your Outlook calendar on Monday. So that's fascinating to me. This, this violated some of your earlier parameters in that I did. it wasn't organic. It was forced on you. You had no emotional capital with this person. They had none with you. But you were able to 
overcome all that because of the structure that you put in place so that you didn't deprioritize it. And then once you were in it, you started realizing some of that benefit that mentors can have. And you yourself started looking forward to it and said, hey, this is this feels good. This tickles the right part of my brain. I want to make sure I do this. Maybe I won't use the epic in basket overflow as my excuse. I want to make sure I go and see this person. Yeah, that's exactly right. And of course, that has to do with the quality of the interaction and who's on the other end and learning in both directions. So this was definitely, you know, a high value ROI kind of investment and relationship. And I could see it paying dividends, although not in our own field, but for the medical center in general and for academic medicine in general. And and again, I was learning from it. And you talk about tickling your brain. It, it brings up a concept in a book that I just finished reading called Love Plus Work, which I'm sure you've read because you're very well read on these types of things. But it talks about a concept of what's referred to as the red threads of your life, which are the things in your life that really flip your switch and make you coming back for more. And that could be at work, it could be recreationally, it could be in any aspect of your life. And that most people, if they're lucky, can incorporate some aspect of that into their career to the age old adage of, you know, if you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life, but nobody really loves everything that they do. Right. So for some people, mentorship is one of their red threads. It makes them excited. It makes them want more of it, they get some kind of a stimulus from it, and particularly watching the product, the mentee graduate, the mentee go on to great things. You take pride in it. And those are the types of people as a mentee that you want to seek out. How do you figure that out? Well, you you look at if they're almost like addicted to it because they did it before, they liked it, they seek it out. Now you have somebody who has a high potential if you're the mentee. And usually you can look at that through their track record, talking to other people that came through their company, came through their medical school, came through their law school, whatever it may be. And looking at that kind of lineage or trail that's after them, you know that they're, you said, it tickles their brain. Their brain is tickled by this process. And the converse is also true. You can look at someone and say, look, I've never seen anybody work well with this person or get anything out of a mentorship relationship with them. Why would I be the first after 20 years on the faculty? Why would this person suddenly get their brain tickled by having lunch with me every month? Probably not going to happen. Awesome. I love that. The book was called Love Plus Work. Yes. Marcus Buckingham, a great book written by a person who's known as a psychometrician, works in the human resources space, British guy, really well written book. Excellent. You know, something important you said, when we all think of mentorship, we think it's two human beings. We think it's a mentor and a mentee, and they're going to relate and great things are going to come out of it. And something that I'm learning in my current leadership role at Stanford is that even in all of these interactions where it is humans only, the structure around those humans can predispose those human interactions to succeed or to fail. And I'm learning there's great value to having process and infrastructure. What you were saying right now made me realize it's the same thing here. While all you need for mentorship is just two people who agree to work together and will meet, having a lot of these parameters as you've already defined in terms of Let's agree on what the goals are. What do you want to get out of it? What do I want to get out of it? Make sure that everyone's on the same page with the specifics. How often are we meeting? Do we have a system in place where we don't have to remember to meet or to reach out? Your cadence of we're going to meet every month over lunch because you got to eat anyway. So it's going to be something that doesn't seem like it's a waste of time. It's while I'm eating, I'm getting to do this. And that might be for surgeons. That might be the one day I know I'm going to eat. Because very often we're stuck in the OR or we kind of just get caught up in clinic and it's the easiest thing in the world for us to thump our chest and say, I don't need to eat. It'll be fine. I'll skip it. But that's that's one day where that structure sort of protects that relationship and allows it, gives it the time to actually sprout into something meaningful and and to grow over time. If it never actually gets to that point because you haven't set those structures in place, you're just hoping that you have one of these mentees that cranks on papers without you ever asking, or you were those mentors that just says, here's an opportunity, here's an opportunity. And while that sounds great, it's relatively rare for that to happen. You need these structures and you need time for the relationship, like every other human relationship, to actually grow. I agree with that 100%. It makes me think of an example I often use is that when we talk to people about protecting their time or new faculty members say, how much protected time do I get? I want to take a job. I want protected time. And I always say, Well, look, you protect your time. Nobody is given or obtains or gets protected time. 
And no matter what happens in a large organization, there will be people who will steal your time. And those people will steal your time even if I try to protect it for you. Something will happen. Something will come up. When it comes to mentorship, being able to carve out time and prioritize it actually gives you an excuse to protect yourself meaning physically looking at your schedule, saying, hey, two weeks from now, I have an event. That event I have to be at, whether it's in your calendar, your phone, your Epic, your Outlook, whatever. And you get to use it to kind of stake out claim for you to spend time doing what you want to do, what tickles your brain, what is your red thread. And this applies to anything that you want to do. Mentorship's one of those exercises. But if you don't do it actively, the system will consume your time and you'll find out that your time was actually determined how you would spend it is determined by some outside agency. And those agencies are, you know, sort of fall into a few different categories. One is the sort of people who you report to, your superiors, who determine what you do by saying, look, I'm your boss and you have to come have a meeting with me. And then there's kind of everybody who reports up to you who demands your time and says, hey, I need to meet with you, your coordinator, your research, your secretary, this person, I need you and the patients, anyone. And then in the middle is you, your your agency to control your own existence, which is generally a very thin slice in the middle of the top down and the bottom up management of your time. And that middle slice, you have to carve out, protect, almost like pushing two walls apart and say like, hey, I have a mentorship. I'm committed to this for the next year. I'm going to spend 12 or 15 hours doing this push back on the other two components of your life and say, if it's a priority, I'm going to use that as an excuse so that nobody gobbles up that time and I'm going to protect it for myself. That's an important life lesson I've learned. Yeah. That reminds me of what you were talking about earlier about you have to make sure you have enough time for this. I think for a lot of us in medicine, because of the way the system is designed, where you are rewarded, you you are valued for just putting your head to the grindstone and just cranking and just you get aside a few more patients or you get aside to extra work, you just do it. It's hard to say no for a lot of people. You alluded to this earlier as well, because you don't say no as a medical student, because otherwise you're seen as not a, a mentee that people might want to work with. You were just supposed to say yes. So when you're a resident and let's say, you know, you want to go into a particular subspecialty, but if you're on a different rotation and someone says, hey, you should write this paper with me. It's so hard for residents to say, no, actually, I don't want to do that because they're afraid of letting that authority figure down. And that's how you end up in a situation where you're in your PGY five year, you've got three unwritten papers from PGology, two unwritten things from Euro Hawk, one from your UDS rotation. And you're so in the, the quagmire, you don't know where to start because certainly saying no or giving away the things is not in the list of options, because God forbid you, you gave something away. You like, I, I'll get it done. I'll get it done. And I think I like what you said about needing to protect your time, both from the mentor and the mentee perspective with this. I think the phrase that I'm working with for my own development right now is taking radical responsibility. You know, you said others will steal your time. I'm hearing it in my head is if we're not intentional about how we choose to use our time, then we are unintentionally giving away our time. And it's still on us to say, wait, I don't want to do that. This is how I want to spend my time right now, whether it be mentoring or, or anything else in life. For sure. I agree with that. It reminds me of a story I probably told you once, but when I was a third year resident, 1996, one of my, I would say, part-time mentors was a retired urologist chair of our department named John Latimer, who at the time was about 88 years old, I want to say, maybe 87 years old. And at nine o'clock at night in our library, I'm making photocopies to do a presentation the next day. And he walks up behind me with a stack of textbooks in his arm, waiting to make photocopies. But I said, oh, Dr. Latimer, I apologize. Please step in front of me here. Let me help you with those books. He goes, no, no, you finish up your photocopies. I'll, I just want to wait here and I'll, I'll make my copies. And, and while I'm sitting there copying, he asked me, he said, how do you decide whether you get involved in a research project or not? How do you decide when to say yes or no when someone asks you to do a research project? And at the time, I was a junior resident. I hadn't really been involved in too much research, hadn't thought much about it. I said, I don't know, I guess I'd look at things like, is it feasible? Can you actually do the project? Can you get a conclusion? Is it something that would 
contribute to, you know, the overall body of knowledge in the field? Is it worth doing? Is it like a valid question? Is it something I'm interested in? Those are the kind of things that rattle around in my head. He goes, yep, those are definitely good things. He said, you better think a lot more about that because the most important thing you're going to do is know which projects to get involved with and which ones not to get involved with. Because a lot of people are going to ask you, hey, do this, do that, join this, join that, help me with this, help me with that. And he said, over my career, my biggest mistakes have been saying yes to things that really probably weren't worth it and saying no to some things that were really great. And I look back and said, oh, I should have, I should have been more involved in that on the, on, from the get-go. And that was 30 plus years ago and still sticks with me every day. And he here was an 88-year-old, you retired chair of our department at nine o'clock at night trying to ask me, like, how do you decide whether to get involved in a project or not, ruminating about this exact issue. So these are not new questions. Your story makes me think of a different question when I'm thinking about it, department chair, something I want to pick your brain about with regards to mentorship. You said earlier that you had tried at Columbia to have a required mentorship structure where everyone would be assigned a mentee and mentor, and you decided it wasn't necessarily working very well. So how do you, as a couple of questions for me out of this, how do you, as someone who's leading a department, ensure that you have a healthy mentorship culture where people are creating time? As you said, it takes time. It takes work. There's lots of other things competing for everyone's time. How do you make sure that faculty are creating that space, are holding those rocks apart, the walls apart, to allow mentorship to happen if it's not required? Yeah, that's a great question. The easiest answer is to pick people who are addicted to it as a culture. In other words, recruiting, whether it's new faculty or new residents, and making sure people have that in their DNA. And you don't have to basically build a system that says you must take X number of hours per week in your schedule and mentor a junior resident or faculty member. And if you do that, Pat Walsh said this once at AUA leadership class many years ago, you just hire the right people and get out of their way. But the key is hire the right people, figure out the people that actually have that same kind of mission in their brain to say, wow, like I would like to climb over everybody so I could get to mentor more people because it's really what I like to do. Of course, sometimes that's not the case. And then not everybody in a department or an organization are the same. And there are more concrete ways of doing it and wrapping it into sort of an evaluation process and using it as part of someone's either compensation or reward and giving credit some level, actual concrete credit to say, hey, list for me the three or four people that you took on last year as a mentor without necessarily measuring the objective output, like show me the number of papers you wrote with a resident. Just how much time did you spend? What did you do? How did you do it? And then getting that feedback from the trainee or from the junior faculty to say, oh yeah, you know, I really look towards that person. Okay, what's the value of that? Is that actually rewarded in some way? Hopefully you don't have to do that to get people to want to do it because they should just want to do it and they should get enough reward out of it without being kind of scored for it. But you can do both. You can hire the right people and set up the right system to reward them. Do you look for people who mentor or people who are specifically good at mentoring? Because I can imagine someone might mentor a lot of people and may not necessarily be good at it. In fact, they may be doing harm to the mentees at that point then. Yeah, that's a great analysis. I mean, it's ideal, obviously, to have people that like it and are good at it, much like the case with surgery or medicine or any other aspect of what we do. You know, you want someone who's not just passionate and has an appetite, but actually has a skill set as well. And I think, thankfully, passion and interest is half the game. Like, you, you know, as long as you're engaged and interested and enjoying it, you're going to be pretty good at it. You're probably not going to screw anything up, but it's more common, I think, to find people that are just disinterested or don't see the value from a mentor perspective that, oh, that's wasted time. That's time I'm committing to someone else's career. That's not, there's nothing in it for me. You know, most people are interested in achieving goals for themselves and oftentimes look at mentor-mentee relationships as paying back with no reward, which I think is short-sighted. I don't think that's the case. That's helpful to hear. Just being passionate is half the game. People who want to do it, if they're actually engaged, they're more likely than not going to be decent mentors and will only get better over time, even if they're not starting as gifted. I think so. Yeah, that, that's my opinion. That half the battle is, is the desire, the passion, and the reward that they get from it. 
and then they might get better at it over time. Much like surgery, you can make pretty much anybody pretty good at surgery, even if they may not inherently be born with gifts of a master surgeon, whatever those are. But if they hate it and they're not very talented, they're probably not going to become competent. I think a lot of mentors don't realize all the different ways that they can have influence on the mentee. I remember a specific interaction very early on that I had with you as my mentor. I was preparing my essay for the Valentine essay contest when I was a junior resident, and you had given me this cockamamie idea to write an essay on the fact that those patients who had renal insufficiency after kidney surgery actually ironically had better survival than those patients who had normal renal function. And it was one obscure paper in some Acta Hungarica, I don't remember where the paper was, somewhere. But I, I wrote I wrote my essay on this and you you read it over for me. And in the hallway, I forget where well, I was rounding in between, oh, I took a look at that paper, the essay that you submitted. And you said, you should do more of this. You're good at it. It was a passing comment. You know, I was going one way, you're going the other. But man, I will tell you, I walked away from that interaction wanting to do so much more work with you. And, oh, he said, you should do more of this. You're good at it. And you were referring to the writings. I want to write. I was suddenly craving to work on another project with you. And I imagine that moment probably didn't stick with you. I'm sure you know, it doesn't ring a bell right now because it was so small, but I knew it was genuine. I, I didn't think that it was manufactured or just said for the sake of saying it. But I walked away thinking, I want to work harder for that guy. And not that I was working for you in that sense, but that was a really effective, small, wise mentor move on your part. And you, you were in your second year as faculty at that point. It's not like you'd been mentoring for 30 years and knew, oh, this would be the exact effect of this one comment. But it had, it had a lasting, clearly had a lasting impact on me. And I think there's a lot of little things that mentors can do where the mentee will say, that's a good mentor. Yeah, I remember that project very distinctly. I don't remember the comment, but you know, it's it's an example of what I said earlier, that we want as mentors to be able to help guide people who have potential into careers that they'll be very successful at, somewhat selfishly because we want our field to get better and to have, you know, great leaders and great thought leaders in it. But a little bit of positive feedback early on and maybe the absence thereof in the converse situation might help shape those kind of things to say, hey, you've got certain skills here that can be developed and you should not just do this once or twice and then go into private practice. Nothing against private practice, but if you have a certain proclivity for doing it and a passion and early on a few people tell you that, that may be worth more than getting a grant 10 years later or something. It may just spark that interest and gets you down a pathway. And those pathways are very different when you're a fourth year medical student or a third year resident. You have a lot of pathways in front of you and trying to steer people into ones that they're going to be more successful at is, is frankly what's fun about it. Excellent. I have no idea how long we've been talking. I could talk to you for hours. So I want to be mindful that, that we don't go too, too long. I know you are on the East Coast and it's well past dinner time for you probably. I have just two questions and then I'll give you an opportunity to say anything that, that's left unsaid for you so far. One, you know, one of the things that's important in our field, always has been important, but I think we've recently been more open-minded about this and more willing to think that we have an active role to play is in ensuring the future of our field and specifically with regard to diversity in the field. If you don't require mentorship in the inorganic way, you know, in the forced way, if you don't require that, how do you account for diversity in encouraging diversity in your program? And how can people be mindful of that? It's a great question. And as a field going through a transformation from 98 plus percent male practitioners, and we just speak about gender diversity to now 90 to 10 and practicing urologists and 70, 30 roughly and training urologists, I think that we've probably learned a lot of lessons on how to do that. We just speak about gender diversity in the field and in the career. And we built up a portfolio of mentors, senior leaders who are women in the field, and I think made a lot of great progress there. When it comes to ethnic and racial diversity, I think that's the, the next frontier. I think that's one that is more challenging because we're still underrepresented in medicine in general and in urology specifically for a lot of 
ethnic and racial subgroups. And I think that you have to sometimes do two things. One, obviously, is identify and promote young faculty mentors who are like the people we're trying to overrepresent or increase representation of. But there's a paucity of that. There's a paucity of at level senior role models and are from diverse backgrounds. And then you have to kind of overcome that your mentor to organically draw in the mentee has to be like, has to be the same, that human nature that you pointed to. And one program that obviously a lot of departments, a lot of institutions have dedicated quite a bit of effort and time to this over the past three to four years. One that we were really excited about here is a relationship with a CUNY or City University of New York Medical School which actually happens to serve a student body that's relatively underrepresented in medicine and has no urology department. So it's a freestanding medical school with minimal hospital affiliations and a huge appetite and interest in surgical specialties, but actually no mentors, no one to develop a relationship with. And under the direction of Gina Bottolato, our vice chair of education, developed a pipeline program where any student in that school who wants to be mentored is basically plugged into our department for either research or clinical rotations that they wouldn't get at their own school because it doesn't exist and actually exposes our group to a population of students that really don't know much about urology and probably without a little bit of a flip of the switch wouldn't be turned on to that career. And that could be any surgical subspecialty or any specialty that they don't have a lot of exposure to in the rotations through their school. So there's a few of those that have popped up around the country now that I think are kind of concrete examples of how to change that in our field. And obviously the AUA and ABU have worked on some national strategies to do it as well. And I think we're going to get there. It's going to take a little bit longer maybe than we'd like, but we're going to get there. I think you're right. There are lots of efforts like that cropping up. It will take a while and I'm hopeful that we'll get there. I spent a lot of time thinking about, and in the meantime, what can I do? What can we individually do? to help make progress. And one of the things I've decided is that to get to the point you were making earlier in identifying the promise, the raw potential that someone has, I think a small comment, just like what you made to me, you should do more of this, you're good at this. I think even if you're not of the same racial or ethnic background, I think if someone who feels at a systematic level or societal level, like, oh, I don't see a lot of people that look like me in that field, I guess I'll look at a different field. But if they were to hear from their cisgender white attending, hey, I think you have a lot of potential in this. I think you should do more of this, or I think you should look into this. I think that can have a powerful effect on our trainees, whether they be medical students looking at residencies or residents thinking about particular subspecialties within their field or should I do academics or not. I think we have a lot of power that we don't realize in terms of helping people refine their thinking about what their options are going forward. Because in the absence of those small little nudges, people will, will make a lot of assumptions. Like, well, I guess I'll look at this, or I'll look at that, or, or that group doesn't have a lot of people like me. One of the things that you told me, getting back to years of my individual mentoring relationship, is when I was finishing my fellowship training, I was considering a couple of different programs to start my faculty career at. And I was taking issue with one program, and I called you, said, yeah, you know, the problem is this place doesn't have a focus on teaching. There's not even students here, etc." And a really important comment you made to me that still sticks with me today was, just remember, Jay, yes, that's true. And the moment you arrive somewhere, you've changed that ecosystem. You are now part of that system, and you can begin to address the deficiency that you are saying is a problem for you. If it's not a priority for that place to focus on teaching, if you get there and you start a rotation, great. Then now, all of a sudden, there is someone there who focuses on teaching, and you can do that. So same idea. I think if a trainee doesn't see someone that looks like them, once they get to that place, now there's someone that looks like them. In fact, that's them that's there. That's a great point. I think everyone has an impact on the system around them and changes it on a, a daily basis. And that's how it starts. It may start small. It may require some pioneering effort to be able to say, oh, I was the first person here to do this or the first person of this background to enter this program. And 100% agree that positive feedback early on melts down walls of this group doesn't look like me or have people in senior roles that are like me. And everybody by human nature wants to go into a field that they seem to be good at and seem to be wanted in. 
In other words, that, that early going is someone saying, hey, come over here, help me with the surgery. Hey, you're pretty good at this. You know, you ever thought about a career in urology? I don't know. I don't know what urology is. I don't know what orthopedics is. I don't, well, you know, after this case, just swing by my office, get a cup of coffee. Let me explain to you what urology is. That is the single most important ingredient to recruiting talent into the field is access to mentors and access to mentors who give you the sense that you could be successful in that field. And we've all had those interactions. Most of it is what resulted in us going into these fields. I didn't even know what a urologist was when I went to medical school. I never heard of it before. A few happenstance interactions with faculty at the time who said, hey, you know what you're doing there. That looks pretty good. And come over here and talk to me afterwards. Did you ever think about this field? No, I ne never thought about this field because I don't know what it is. I don't even I know what this rotation's about. Oh, well, come back at the end of third year. Let's talk. Bang. That just went up my list of options like tenfold. Well, how many personal statements have we both read over the years that start out with, I was shadowing this person during college or during my second year of med school, and that's how I learned of this field, to, to your exact point. Right. But if that person you're shadowing says, hey, you know, you're pretty mediocre and I'm miserable in my career, and even though you look exactly like me, I would suggest you don't do it, that's usually not resulting in a personal statement to apply in urology. Absolutely. We always hear, and I just said, I'm guilty of this myself, I said a couple minutes ago that everyone wants to be in a field or in a group where there are others that look like them. And I doubt this study has been done, but I wonder what the results would be if we asked medical students or residents, would you rather be in a program where everyone looks exactly like you and no one supports you or you have zero mentorship? Or would you rather be in a program where no one looks like you, but you feel absolutely valued and you feel like you're getting great kindness and mentorship from those people that look nothing like you? I suspect I know the answer to that, but I, obviously the study hasn't been done. Well, I, I want to wrap things up with my last question and appropriately is around closure. How do you close the mentor-mentee relationship? How do you say, okay, it's done. And I'm not asking because after 21 years, I'm still <laughs> hanging out to your, <laughs> your guidance here. Yeah. But do you ever say, okay, you've gotten, oh, we agreed on these goals. And now you've gotten into residency. I've done with you. Or, hey, this is really not working out. You've not held up your end of the bargain. I've been eating lunch by myself for the last five months. I need to close this. Walk me through what the various ways of closing a successful or unsuccessful mentor-mentee relationship look like. Well, the successful one is easy, and you answered it for yourself, is you don't. <laughs> you actually don't. There's no closure. <laughs> it doesn't end. I mean, maybe the lunches stop, but it's really, in my mind, in some degrees, a lifetime commitment, a lifetime relationship, and that anybody that I've had the honor of getting to know or help in their career calls me or contacts me anytime, day or night for the rest of their life. It just restarts. It might be 10 seconds in an email 20 years later, but you don't close it, right? So the, the contact may decrease, the, the opportunities may decrease, but that relationship is longstanding. If it was successful, everybody's happy about it. You become an alumni of that mentoring relationship and you can reactivate it free of charge anytime, anywhere. And again, usually at the benefit of the mentor, more so than the mentee. Hey, I have this career decision to make. Oh, really? That's interesting because that's very similar to what's going on at my place. Tell me more about this big career decision you have to make. <laughs> and I'm taking furious notes about your new job and this and that. Oh, this is fascinating. What are you going to do about that? Tell me how you're going to handle that problem. Oh, that's a great idea. Thanks for the call. Wait a second. What just happened here? You know, the unsuccessful one we talked a little bit about earlier, that's usually peters out organically or you sort of declare that it's not working out. But the successful one is the more exciting one. And that's the one where, you know, it really doesn't end. It just keeps going forever. And you talk about closure and wrapping up. There's one other sort of anecdote that I wanted to throw in there. And that is I had an opportunity about 10 years ago to sit on a panel that was reevaluating the structure of all departments mentoring their faculty at Columbia. And I was charged with meeting with 12 faculty members from 12 non-urology departments, all junior level people for a feedback session where they were going to talk to me about what their department had in place for faculty development, mentorship, quarterly, annual. This is faculty to faculty, not residents. And we were going to try to structure some mandatory, every department must do this every year, every month, every quarter. 
And the funniest thing that they brought up, which changed my evaluation process of looking at this as a department chair, was that to a person, every one of them said, oh, my direct report says that they have a mentoring meeting with me every year. And I said, okay, you know, that sounds good. What department are you in? Yeah, it's when they call me in at the end of the year and go over my RVUs and say that I missed my target and that I'm not getting a raise next year. And then they ask me if I have any questions and then they close the door. And then I say, you know, I've been working here four years and I really feel my career is stalling and I haven't really been getting a lot of support and mentorship. Like, what do you mean? We have a meeting every year. It's in your file. Every year I met with you to talk about your career. And like, actually, no, you talked about my performance and you gave me a performance evaluation. And I said, oh, come on. They can't possibly think that that's a definite. Every single faculty member, 12 different departments said, yep, that's exactly what happens to me. And then they said, oh, your mentorship meeting went great last year. You hit your target and you went over it by 20 percent. Any questions? So mentorship is not the same as performance evaluation. And this is very much true for faculty, faculty interactions, not so much residency, but more so faculty. So young faculty get out there. You have to teach your group that there's a difference between evaluating how you're performing, and that could be academic performance, clinical performance, educational performance, and then stop doing that, close that chapter, and physically walk away from it. And I actually changed in our department that we do those sessions. And at a different time of the year, we do faculty mentoring and meetings about career advancement, promotion, where are you, how are you getting forward, what's the next step, with no mention in that session. It's illegal to talk about anything that has to do with performance or performance evaluation or any of that kind of qualitative assessment of output. That's not mentoring. And I was shocked that one, I was guilty of it at some times early on as a chair, and also that it was consistently reported across an entire group of diverse faculty from diverse different areas of the medical center. So just a warning that performance evaluation is absolutely not mentorship. Yeah, you bring up a really important point. I want to expand on that. For me in the mentoring relationships that I have as a mentor, one of the things that I spend a lot of time early on is trying to create the psychological safety for the mentee to be themselves. Because otherwise, they will automatically enter into that I'm going to be evaluated mode where they'll say the things that you want to hear, what they think that you want to hear. And then you, you get very filtered, very processed answers that, that will lead to an A. And I spend a lot of time saying, yes, you're talking to an academic urologist. And yes, I hear you want to go to urology. And you have to think about, do you truly want to be an academic or are you saying that because you think that's what I want to hear? Do you truly want to do a fellowship at the hardest place that's going to take this many years out of your life? Or is that the answer you think I expect from you? And I think we have to work hard, similar to your comment about it, you have to make sure it's not just performance evaluation, to make sure that the mentee also knows that I can truly say what I think. The mentor is here not to evaluate me, but to help me grow in the ways that are most meaningful to me. To your earlier point about the, the successful relationship never ending, And getting back to our earliest comments about the parameters you have to set, the metaphor that I have in my mind with all of this is the relationship, the mentor-mentee relationship is like a flower or a plant of some sort. And early on, you have to be very intentional in guarding the relationship. You have to have structures in place to protect it. Things like your monthly meetings, make sure that you have all the right things in place. And if you do it right and you water it and you tickle each other's brains in the right ways, over time it grows. And after 21 years like ours, we can go long stretches of time without talking, without necessarily watering a relationship. And we know that that tree of our relationship will still be there to bear fruit for each of us in the various ways that we need. How's that metaphor? Kind of just made it up on the fly. I like it. I like it. I I, I mean, I may be guilty of not watering my plants enough and letting them die in my office. So maybe it's not the perfect one for me, but I hope I'm a better mentor than I am a gardener. Yeah. You, I don't see any plants behind you. So you will. I can definitely tell you, I don't know about your, your horticultural skills, but but you're, you're, you're spot on with the mentoring. Well, I'll give you the final word here, Jim. Any other thoughts that, that you want to share to the budding mentor, to the budding mentees, to the larger field of, of our audience who might be listening this far into the podcast and 
or hanging on your, your final word? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I really enjoyed doing this. I really appreciate the opportunity and the time you spent to build the program. But I think the best thing is that duality of the relationship. And we sort of thought about it as a mentor and a mentee, but the mentor is a mentee and mentees, quote unquote, junior people should look for opportunities to mentor, right? There's always someone that can learn from you that's quote unquote, below you coming up the ladder and residents can mentor other residents. Residents can mentor students. Students can mentor students. And there's never too early to get involved and you'll become a better mentee by trying out some mentoring, right? And you'll become a better mentor by occasionally seeking out to be a mentee from someone more senior to you. So this is, a, it works upwards, it works downwards, and everybody should be involved. This is not just what the faculty can do for you or what you can do for the faculty. It works in both directions. And as I said at the open, it really, I think, pays more dividends for career guidance, counseling, and growth for the mentor than it does for the mentee in most situations, even though that's not the common perception. I love that. I love the reminder that it's a process. This is the whole concept of mentoring and being a, a mentee. It is just an opportunity for growth for all of us as we go through the various stages of our careers. And you never stop being a mentee. I'm attesting to right now with you. And it's never too early to be a mentor for someone else coming up behind you. I think that's a great place to to end. Jim, thank you so much for taking this time. I really enjoyed the conversation. I've enjoyed all the pearls of wisdom that you've shared today and that you've shared over the last 21 years with me as my mentor. I don't think words are enough to truly express to you how much I appreciate you. Thank you for doing this. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in Chicago at the AUA in a couple of weeks. Thanks. Really appreciate it, Jay. Thank you. As I said at the close there, you don't realize it, but I'm the one who get the advantage from being your mentor, and you've taught me a lot more than I've taught you, so thanks a lot. Ah, the tar will be. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Devante Delbrun. Social media and PR by G. Ding. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.